Thank you very much. So again, my name is uh, Stefan Lagerholm. Uh, I work for a company called Secure64 Software Corporation. And uh, we, um, we do DNS servers. That's the only thing we do. So, um, you know, we've encountered and have some experience in rolling out uh, DNS servers in different environments, including IPv6. And I'll share some of the experience that we've had. I'm also uh, the board uh, on the board uh, of the Texas IPv6 Task Force. We've been uh, doing events um, trying to promote IPv6 in Texas for about five years now. And we recently had an, a successful event in uh, Dallas where Vint Cerf was our keynote speaker. So, uh, you know, with him being the father of the Internet, it's interesting, of course, to listen to him to talk about the importance of IPv6 moving forward. And really seeing, you know, he, his vision was, you know, the Internet of Things that are coming now you know, really is going to need IPv6, otherwise it's not really going to work. And also DNS, of course, you know, when you have the Internet of Things and you have millions of devices that you need to address uh, and talk to, you know, how do you, how do you um, address them in an in a intelligent way? And that's where, you know, DNS would come in as well. So today I'm going to talk about IPv6 and DNS. Um, a little bit more background about Secure64. Um, you know, one thing that's different from, uh, for, uh, between us and, and a lot of other DNS vendors is that we actually have our own operating system. So we built an operating system from scratch. We're not basing it, uh, you know, our products on Linux or FreeBSD or anything like that. And that, of course, has, uh, you know, a lot of challenges, um, also certainly around IPv6, how to implement to support you know, all the RFC standards and, and, you know, different options in terms of uh, how to implement uh, support for IPv6. We have two types of um, um, uh, customers. We have large service providers, like, like um, most of you guys out here that are using our, our product. And we also have um, uh, top-level domains and RIRs uh, around the world that are using our uh, product. Actually, three out of the five uh, RRR, RRR, RIRs are using some of our security products. And we hope that we can add LACNIC, perhaps, at some point to, to that list. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some basics, just quickly, uh, to set the stage, and then uh, focus on DNS64, um, and then some uh, a little bit newer RFCs, the 464 XLAT RFC, as well as the heuristics discovery of the um, DNS64 uh, prefixes, RFC 7050. And then I'm going to talk about uh, reverse delegation in IPv4, uh, IPv6, which is a problem. And there's a draft, an IETF draft there from Howard that you might, that name might be familiar because you might have heard him speak uh, earlier today. Unfortunately, the draft is no longer uh, current, so I'm hoping that uh, you can uh, continue to push that in the IETF because I think it's an important uh, piece um, uh, for IPv6 to how to get this reverse delegation to work properly. Uh, so I'll talk about that, and then I'm going to end, end talking about IPv6 and small packets. It was interesting hearing some previous speakers here talking about fragmentation and DNS and IPv6, and, and uh, I wasn't aware of the packet loss that uh, he experienced in his uh, experiments there, so it makes me a little bit scared here, um, um, you know, how, how, how uh, all of this will work, you know, in, re in, re in real life, so to say. Uh, you know, but I, I'll discuss a little bit. This is... is a lot of different um, uh, packet sizes that you need to take into account on DNS. You know, everything is UDP-based, so it's not as easy as TCP, perhaps, to, um, um, to implement a, 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 an optim optimal algorithm. Um, some previous speakers talked about, uh, you know, there's still IPv4 addresses left. Um, uh, here in Latin America and, and in Africa and so on. Uh, a, uh, actually, Aaron ran out of IPv4 addresses. They down to their last slash eight here, and they did that, I think it was a week ago or something. So they were in the phase, I, I believe it's phase three or phase four, what, whatever they call that phase, where they uh, are very restricted on how they hand out v4 addresses. And, and LACNIC, I think, has the lowest supply of IPv4 addresses currently because they have only set aside a slash nine for for the, the next coming phases of the depletion phases here. And, and they're down to like 0.63 or something like that of, that, of a slash eight, so pretty low. So up until now, and you know, it's interesting to hear other speakers kind of have the same opinion. Up until now, you know, dual stack has been a viable alternative. But moving forward, really looking into 
looking beyond dual stack and how can you implement a v6 only network and translate back to v4 when you need to is probably a, a good strategy and, and you just kind of skip the dual stack uh, idea. Uh, you know, here's some basic uh, uh, on DNS. You guys probably know this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but it's a three-tiered architecture, different from web, for example, which is, a, you know, you have a client, a web browser, and you have a DNS uh, or a um, uh, web server, and they connect direct directly to each other. In DNS, it's a three-tiered architecture, so you have this um, recursive uh, DNS, typically provided by the service provider, and that one is the one who's doing all the job uh, sending queries over the internet to the authoritative uh, DNS server uh, where the content provider typically provides um, that and they load their zone files into the authoritative DNS server. And uh, you provision uh, your DNS, you can either do it via DHCP or you can, of course, you know, like in Windows or in Unix, you would fill out, you know, etcresolve.com or in Windows there's a, a GUI you can click in and you can, you know, fill in your DNS server and point it to your DNS server. And um, when, when a, an application then needs to convert a host name to an IP address, it would use uh, built-in library functions, you know, stub, we call it a stub resolver. Um, so um, uh, to call like a get host by name or, or get add info is the correct system call to actually get all the v4 and v6 address in return. So you do one call, the browser will do one call to get add info and we'll get a list of v4 and v6 addresses back. And it will prefer the v6 addresses in front of the v4. So we'll test v6 first. That's, that's how it's supposed to work. And um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of problems uh, around this because uh, the client preferred v6, and the v6 was perhaps broken. It didn't work. And there was a very long time out before the client moved over to IPv4. And that caused a lot of problems. And people talked about the happy eyeballs. And uh, some other speakers covered that already. Uh, but that's certainly a problem. Uh, you don't want to, um, you know, when you turn on IPv6, you want to make sure it works as good or even better than what it did with v4. So that's certainly a problem. And thankfully, that seems to be resolved now with Chrome and Firefox and so on, uh, implementing the happy eyeball um, uh, technology. And the last kind of basic slide here, you know, keep in mind all the queries in IPv uh, in DNS are independent of each other. So you can have a quad A query for you know, a v6 address coming in over v4 transport or the other way around. And it's also independent that you know, if you have a recursive DNS server, if a client asks for a quad A over v4, you could use v4 or, even, or, or perhaps v6 on your outgoing interface. So it's not related to each other there. So uh, flexibility in how the server selects uh, whether it's going to use v4 and v6. A recursive DNS server typically will keep track of the round trip times and eventually it can figure out what are the closest DNS servers that I can communicate with and it's going to communicate with those independent of whether they are IPv4 or IPv6. Um, most of the root servers now have v6 addresses. There's two or three of the 13 that do not have it. Um, recently the C root server was added. Um, um, keep in mind, however, that you know there's been some peering issues with the service provider that runs the C root server. So you might want to double check that you have good v6 connectivity uh, to them and potentially take actions if you don't, because otherwise you'll have a lot of queries being dropped when the DNS servers are trying to communicate with the C root server. Um, a couple of years ago, um, there was a technology to um, try to fix this happy eyeball. Um, and it's called a Yahoo hack or filter quad A on v4 transport. The idea there was that unless the client can prove that he can speak IPv6, we're not going to uh, send him to any IPv6 sites. So we're, gonna, um, we're not going to send him any quad A records back to that client. So essentially, we're removing one of the four options here for incoming queries and say, if a quad A comes in over v4, we're not going to respond to that. We're going to say there is no um, quad A record, even if there are, and then the client would revert back to, to uh, A queries. So the idea is here, if, if the client can actually connect to the DNS server over IPv6, chances are that his DNA, um, IPv6 connectivity is good enough that we can actually send back quad A records. 
So this was kind of a hot topic two, three years ago. We had a lot of service providers asking for this type of functionality, and we implemented it into our, our system. And there's also Bind and uh, whatever other um, uh, products out there, they also have similar options. Uh, this setup is becoming increasingly rare. Uh, uh, less and less uh, questions about this, and people seem to turn it off instead of, of turning this on. And especially now with Chrome and Firefox and so on supporting the happy eyeball draft, this is no longer really um, necessary to, to implement this, thankfully, because it was always kind of a hack. And it broke some stuff. For example, in uh, Windows XP, you could never, uh, it was impossible to uh, provision a, an IPv6 DNS server. So if you had v6 um, clients that were using Windows XP in an environment like this, they would never be able to communicate you know, with those Quad A records. They would never get the Quad A records. So thankfully, this is something we don't have to worry about. And we can kind of um, uh, um, hopefully put to, to history. But one thing that is very common, and which is an RFC, is DNS64. So DNS64 uh, ma makes it possible for you to move a network directly to IPv6 without having to deploy dual stack. Uh, so it's one of many transition algorithms, uh, of course. You know, we've heard about others. You can tunnel, or you can uh, you know, use, use dual stack, or, or you know, different translation, uh, other translation mechanisms. Um, and it still allows then IPv6 only clients to access v4 only content. And it's defined in a, a, an RFC. It requires both the DNS64 server as well as a NAT64 server. So you would you know, talk to your typical um, network equipment vendor for NAT64 devices and then uh, your DNS vendor for uh, DNS64. And you would have to have both those components to run a DNS64, NAT64 network. And there are still some issues running DNS64. So some applications and some websites, they have IPv4 literal. So they have embedded IPv4 addresses in, into the page, for example. And if you have something like that, then um, you know, DNS64 is not going to work. So that's a problem. And, and typically, you know, like when, when Skype, for example, does not work, that's a huge problem for a service provider. They cannot, you know, it's not a, a 100% service, and they cannot really promote such a service. So they need to fix that. And, and you can, of course, combine this with dual stack or other standards. Um, so you, you try to force people to use IPv6 by um, using DNS64. But then if they have to fall back, you still have v4 connectivity to them. So looking a little bit under the hood how this works. Um, so on the left-hand side here, we have a client. It's going to be a V6 only client, right? Because we just, um, it just has a V6 network. And this client wants to go to grandma's blog, which is an IPv4 only website. But since it's an, uh, he doesn't know that, so he's trying to um, communicate now and, and send out the DNS query. And it's sending a quad A DNS query uh, because he's only got V6 um, connectivity. So there's no point in sending an A query. And then a DNS64, we will you know, send that up to the authoritative DNS server. If it comes back as an empty response, meaning that there is no IPv6, there is no quad A record, then instead of just sending that back to the client, uh, we would continue the algorithm. If we get the, a quad A record back, then we would send that back. And the client, of course, you know, have v6 connectivity and, and can proceed immediately to uh, download whatever content uh, it wants. But if it's an empty answer, then instead of just sending that back to the client, we go out and query again for an A record. And if we find an A record uh, for, for this grandma's blog, we take that 192.0.2.1 in this example, and we convert it into hex, and we append the prefix that's configured in, into our DNS servers. So we create on the fly a synthetic, if you wish, um, um, IPv6 address. And we send that back to the client. So the client is happy. He thinks that there's a v6 uh, address that he can connect to. So uh, he's going to try to connect. And that whole prefix is then routed to the NAT64 device. So the NAT64 device can then remove the, um, you know, uh, the prefix and, and just extract the v4 address, convert it back to, to v4, and send it out to the, to the web server. So it's a stateless. There's no synchronization needed here between the DNS64 and the NAT64 device. And that's what makes this uh, very easy to implement. Uh, um, 
So it work, works very well, and uh, you know, other than some broken application and websites, this, this tends, tends to work very well. And of course, um, if you have native IPv6, if you have v6 content, the client will not go through all this. It will just go directly to that uh, content. So essentially what we're doing is that we're only allowing for uh, quad A queries over IPv6 and we were making, we were skipping the rest. There's no point from the client to send anything else because it's a v6 only client. On the northbound interface, however, you can, uh, you know, we could send uh, both uh, over IPv4, IPv6. It could be the case that the DNS server has, and it probably should because not that many DNS servers are, you know, reachable over IPv6. So the DNS server probably needs a v4 address so it can communicate on the internet to resolve those. Uh, 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 queries. And some people say, well, this sounds crazy. I don't want to go to a V6 only network. It, it, it's, it's too big of a leap for me. And that might be right in your network. But keep in mind that I think everybody at some point will need technology like this. So let's say today, maybe you can get 10% IPv6 and 90 is IPv4. But this is, will grow. More and more people will implement IPv6 and uh, as eventually you will you know, get to a point where 90% of the traffic is IPv6 and 10 is IPv4. At some point, you want to get rid of that long tail. And you know, whether your threshold is 90% or 95 or 99 or 999999 I don't know. So it depends on your network. But once you want to get rid of that long tail, you just don't want to cut people off and say, you cannot reach grandma's blog anymore. You want to provide some means for them to still access the old classic uh, IPv4 internet. So whether you want to implement the ENS64 today, or two years from uh, today, or five years from today, it remains to be seen. It's up to you. But I think everybody uh, will need this at some point when they want to turn, on, uh, turn off uh, IPv4 and go to a v6-only uh, network. So as I said, DNS64, it didn't really uh, work, and there were some applications that were broken, like Skype, some websites. So uh, there were some uh, additional efforts in the IETF to try to handle those. One of them is the RFC 6877, 464XLAT, uh, is a way of handle those broken applications and websites. And as you can see in the little diagram at the bottom there, you have a PLAT, um, which is the provider's address translation. This is the same device that you would use for DNS64. So if you combine this with DNS64, there's no need to buy any additional devices. It's the same translation device. And then you have a CLAT, which is the client's um, translation, which is a stateful translation that either can reside in the in customer equipment, or if this is a handset, a, 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 a wireless phone or something like that, you know, everything could be compressed into one device. And this is supported already by, by Android OS, so, so you can set up and you can configure this with a plat subnet. There's a configuration file. I'm not sure if it's reachable for an end consumer, but this can be provisioned from, from a service provider. And you can, you can tell the subnet. So this subnet is the same subnet as you would use for DNS64. So once the client knows this subnet, it can now um, do some translation on its own, similar to what the, um, what the service provider is doing in the plat, in the CLAT, to make sure that everything that comes out from this handset is uh, v6 uh, only. And then in the plat, it will be translated back to v4 if needed. Um, and an extension to this would be RFC 7050. So instead of having to provision this plat network, um, there's an, um, an intelligent way of figuring out this um, um, prefix instead. So you can configure Android with plat from DNS64 hostname, and then Android will send out a few intelligent queries to figure out whether, you know, what is this uh, prefix. And there is a, a special address called ipv4only.arpa that's created. So you can do a dig or uh, you can do a, um, a test and see um, uh, if, you, if you do a uh, DNS query for that um, uh, host name and, and for a quad A, and if you get a response back, you know that you are behind some type of translator because that is for sure by the IETF 
an address that should never have a quad A record. So it's a good way of figuring out whether you're behind a translator or not. And if you are, you can then extract the prefix and you can use this in your handset to do your own translation when, when you need to, when you have IPv4 liter literals. And with this type of technology, you know, we solved the problem of broken applications. So all of those applications that were broken, they, uh, with v4 literals, they now uh, uh, start to work. <coughs> and then uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about the reverse uh, delegation in IPv6. Um, you know, everybody has heard, you know, the, the space, how large the IPv6 space is, so I'm not going to go through that. You know, I, I usually uh, say, you know, 4 billion disks of uh, 400 gig each. That's what you would need if you would have, if you would want to generate all the records to, for a slash 64. So obviously that doesn't work. So we need to find out a method of um, providing reverse delegations. And really it's, it's all about service parity or feature parity. So a service provider, um, you don't want to have help desk calls from people saying, hey, I can't send emails or I can't log in via SSH or, you know, there's a timeout when I try, you know, what's going on. They probably even don't, they don't even know whether they're connecting via over, over IPv4 or IPv6, and they shouldn't really care about it. It's just a transport protocol. But what's scary is when you don't have that feature parity or, or service parity, if, if you're a service provider, then, you know, you might end up having people um, calling you uh, with, with those types of, of calls. It turns out whether it a, a, was the right decision or not, but a lot of... Um, spam gateways and so on, they're actually using the reverse delegation to make sure that there is a reverse delegation. And if there's no reverse delegation, they mark the, the messages as, as being spam. So, so you, you, you encounter problems like this if you don't have reverse delegation. In IPv4, typically how people have been doing this is they've been using a clause in, in, in Bind and other DNS products called Generate. Um, and they've generated um, uh, yes, the, the mappings and they maybe call it, you know, customer4321.provider.net or even maybe have some geographic um, in there saying, okay, this is in Houston or this is in Cancun or whatever. So you can see, if you do this reverse delegation, you can actually see where the client probably came from. Uh, but that doesn't work in, in IPv6. So um, uh, there's four, uh, Howard lays out in the draft and uh, a, a couple of different alternatives uh, you can uh, delegate, uh, which is not practical. It's, it's not, that's, that's a huge no-no. It's not going to really work. There's no uh, standard on how to do this. So that's, that's probably the, the worst option. You can use dynamic DNS, which encounters some scaling issues, because if you would have all the clients send dynamic DNS every time they start up, that's a ton of um, dynamic DNS uh, requests that you would have to process. Um, and then you can use wildcard, which is not the perfect solution because it, does not, it doesn't have this one-to-one -one mapping be between um, IP address and host name and back from host name to IP address. Uh, or you can use synthetic IPv6, which is not really widely implemented, and then there's no RFC standard for how this, this should work. So just kind of looking another view over the different options you would have. Uh, of course, you can also do nothing and just say, we're going to run the risk that some stuff's going to be broken, but hopefully it's not going to be that bad. Uh, you use wildcards. It's, it's widely available in DNS servers, so you don't have to invest in any new technology. Um, uh, dynamic DNS, you know, as I said, there's some scaling issues there. You need a ton of new servers to be able to do that, so very difficult to implement. And then the synthetic DNS is is probably a, you know a, a, a good options here and and we uh, based on requests from our customers we have implemented a, a way of doing this and I know there's a few other DNS vendors that have also done this so this is efforts that's been going on without really the blessing of IETF but thankfully we don't have always to listen to the IETF we can listen to our customers and implement what they uh, need and what they ask for but I'm more than happy if, if if we can get some consensus and take something like this into the IETF uh, to get it standardized. Because, of course, there's interoperability issues. If, if we go and implement it one way, and then, you know, another DNS vendor implements it in, in another way. But traditionally, how it's been sold is with this generate clause, as I said. And then, as you can see, um, on IPv4, you get some type of response back, client1234.example.com. 
but a, a, a similar IPv6 query would not give you anything back or like an NX domain back. So this is obviously uh, not feature parity, but when the, with a feature, uh, with a synthetic, you can then, um, like a regular expression, you can create a rule set on how you would want to have this being um, um, reversed, and um, you can propagate that out to all your slave servers, and you can do that on the fly when the query comes in. So it doesn't take up any memory or anything, it's just being done on the fly. Uh, another interesting thing here on the authoritative side is um, you know, an interesting question here. When, when you start to enable IPv6 for your authoritative servers, you essentially have two options. On the left-hand side, you can take, in this case, NS2, and you can say, okay, well, this is a dual stack server, so I'm gonna have both an IPv4 and a Quad A for IPv6 record for, for that server. Or you can do it like on the right-hand side, and you can say, okay, well, I have NS1 and NS2 today. I'll add an extra DNS record in my zone NS3, and that's the one that got the IPv6 address. They could actually, NS2 and NS3 could be the same server, but you just express it differently in the, in the host files. And uh, it, it turned out, turns out actually, I ran some experiments with this, it turns out that most um, DNS servers, they actually, um, uh, it doesn't matter how you configure it, they will send queries, a third of the queries will go to each one of those servers, regardless of how it's configured. Uh, with the name servers. Uh, so I, if you need to, if you're in, uh, if you want to do this, I would recommend the left method because it's a little bit smaller. As you can see, there's only two NS records there as opposed to three NS records. So it's a little bit uh, smaller way of representing, representing it. But both of them works and, and both of them will send the same amount of queries to NS1, NS2, and NS3. <coughs> And the last thing I want to talk about here before I open up for some questions is DNS and network packets. And this is especially true for us when we have our own OS that you know, we, we need to, to make, take this into account and see how do we best optimize um, algorithms. There's a lot of um, uh, different limits in DNS. So you got the 512 byte limit, which is the old before eDNS zero came about maximum packet size that was defined for uh, DNS. So if you had more than 512 bytes, uh, you were supposed to switch to TCP. But then came uh, eDNS zero, which is an RFC standard, and said, okay, well, you can actually go up to 4096 now, um, so, so before you switch to TCP, and that offloaded. You know, switching to TCP is very expensive, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, you, you might have a server that, you know, sends 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, or even more, queries per second, um, you know, you don't want to switch to TCP unless you have to. So that took out uh, some of the pressure. But we also have the, uh, you know, IPv6 minimum MTU, which is 1280, and then the Ethernet frame that's 1500. So uh, most DNS packets are actually very small packets, right? So unless you start doing DNSSEC or other fancy things, you'll see, you know, packets of like 100 bytes or something like that. Even with DNSSEC, actually, if you ask, there's some DNSSEC queries that are, you know, a couple of thousand bytes large, but um, yes, to ask for a www. you know, something that's signed .com, um, even including the uh, signatures, typically you can fit them in around 1,000 bytes. So they're not that large, actually. They're smaller than maybe what you think of. And uh, we came to the conclusion here that the, a fancy, um, algorithm does not really pay off here. So instead, just try to be um, simple and not try to optimize, um, you know, the, the, um, the size of the packets. And especially around the packet too big issues that we have in IPv6. So this is, in my opinion, one of the largest issues in IPv6. Uh, as we know, there's no intermediate fragmentation in IPv6, so you can fragment at, at the endpoints, but <clears throat> you cannot fragment, um, any routers cannot fragment. So when a router encounters a packet that's too big for the router to process, it's supposed to send an um, ICMP packet too big back to the client, which first of all means that you need to open all your firewalls for ICMP packet too big, which is um, a little bit scary. 
But if you do that, <clears throat> so assuming that uh, you know the, this authoritative server here on the right hand side, it's trying to send back a response. It's over 1,500 bytes, and uh, the, the 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 router is not a, is not capable of processing it. So it's sending a packet to Big Back. Then uh, you know if if it gets that response back, keep in mind here that the source address of this ICMP packet is not the you know end. Um, and the user, the recursive resolver on the left-hand side. The source address is the, the router, right? So you need a hell of an algorithm to figure out here what session was this actually packet to big related to. So you need to go in, and the idea is that inside of this ICMP packet to big, the router is supposed to add as much as possible of the offending packet uh, to aid you know, the end node from figuring out which session did its packet um, um, relate to. And then you go, got to keep track of all your, you know, all your destinations in the world and which ones are actually you got a packet too big from um, and which one you didn't and then you know, adjust your, your uh, outgoing packet sizes based on that large um, list of, of um, um, uh, routers that you got packet too big from, or, or destinations that you got packet too big from. So it's a rather fancy algorithm that you would have to implement. It takes up memory, takes up CPU time, and when we start looking at this, uh, say, well, what do we do here? We came to the conclusion we're better off from DNS, from a DNS standpoint, because 99.9% .9 of our traffic is just DNS, and it's typically small packets. So we're better off that if, if we encounter this problem, Yes, don't send those large packets. Make sure that everything is under 1280 bytes, which is the uh, MTU for, um, for, uh, for IPv6. So we would, uh, if, if we need to send 1500 bytes response back, we, we would split it up in two packets instead. And that way we could kind of go under the radar and be able to send this back to the, um, to the querier in this case um, without any packet too big issues. So really where you have the problem is, is between the IPv6 MTU, 1280 bytes, uh, up to uh, the, the 4096 where, where you for sure will switch to TCP. So there's a part here of, of packet sizes where you can run into some interesting uh, problem. So with that, I'm um, opening up for any questions and also, of course, want to thank the LACNIC committee and the FLIP6 um, committee for inviting me and also the translator that I've been listening to. Uh, they've been doing a tremendous job, so thank you very much. Un aplauso para los traductores. Well, well, Stephen, thank you so much for remembering the translators. I cannot imagine <laughs> to be translated so many times, the so many words and letters that we mention every minute almost. So they, they do a great effort. Um, bueno, estamos abiertos preguntas para Stephen. Quiero, I want to congratulate him because even when the topics he was talking about were a kind of deep Technically speaking, I believe it was very nice the way you talk about uh, that. Uh, that sometimes that, that is not easy to to do it. Thank you. Preguntas. Bueno, eh, yo si te quiero, eh, I, I, yo yo si quiero hacerte dos consultas. Do you have the translator or not? Let's Well, the first question is the following. At the beginning, you said that your company only, only, only does DNS. Is that right? Right. So you were talking about NAT64. Right. Does, does Secure64 also does NAT64 in, some, in any way? No, we don't, we don't do the NAT64 piece. So that would be you know, some like a Cisco or Juniper or A10 or somebody like that that would do the NAT64 piece and we would do the DNS64 uh, piece. So, so this is, and this is something, especially in the wireless service provider world, where we have seen a lot of interest um, uh, for quite some time now. That seems to be um, where 
DNS64 makes most sense because you're using your handset, your Android or uh, iPhone, whatever you have, you're using it as a browser, you're surfing out your outbound traffic. There's no really incoming traffic to it. So that use case is something that DNS64, NAT64 supports very well. And uh, you know, I, I know there's efforts going on on, on more of a cable providers and, and you know, DSL type of providers. Uh, and they also want to try to implement uh, DNS64, NAT64. But it might be a little bit longer hurdle there uh, to do that because it's not one end node. It's, it might be a, a CPE or some type of gateway in the home. And then after that, you have a large set of um, uh, all kinds of equipment at home, you know, PlayStations and phones and, and all kinds of stuff. So it might be a little bit com more complicated there where, where DNS64 might not be uh, the best fit. Uh, but uh, certainly something to still consider, even in those types of environments. Well, saying that, my question was going to be, if, since you have been a consultant, if in some topology, have you ever fixed running a Skype over NAT64? Anyhow, maybe with any so, trick or something. So, yeah, so Skype is one of those applications that, and I haven't followed this, and they might have fixed it lately, but it's one of those applications that did not work over NAT64. It was broken. It was, there was a built-in root servers for Skype that were v, v, V4 only, and they were hard-coded into the application itself. So it, it, you could never get it to work. But I know that with the XLAT technology today, so if you have an Android handset with this XLAT, you can use Skype without any problem on a V6 only network, and it, it will work. So, so there's some good progress there, but it required a service provider to add some additional functionality into, their, um, into the handsets. Any other question? Alguna pregunta para el amigo Stefan? Entonces, en ese caso, un fuerte aplauso. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Estefan, por la exposición desde, desde el ACNIC y personalmente.